would like everyone in the room to take a moment and think back to when you were 12 years old. Maybe you were taking pre-algebra classes, riding your bicycle, hanging out with your friends. And maybe it wasn't the easiest time. I know I certainly went through a little bit of an awkward phase. But I want you to take that mental image and contrast it with what it's like to grow up as a 12-year-old girl in the developing world. Imagine that your parents decided that you should stop going to school last year because they can only afford to send your brothers. And they think that your place is in the home and you walk miles every day to get water from the nearest well and to collect firewood. Imagine that one day you come home and your parents tell you that they're going to marry you off to a much older, middle-aged man. And you realize that not only will you be raped repeatedly, but you also will probably be pregnant within the next year. It's conditions like this that cause women to develop maternal health injuries, such as obstetric fistula, which I'll be talking about in a minute. I want to start, though, by telling all of you uh, my story about how I started my nonprofit and what we're trying to accomplish. And then I want to look big picture at some of the problems that girls and women face around the world. We're going to look at health, education, and opportunity, and see these as opportunities for empowering women and girls in the developing world so that they can reach their full potential. And then finally, I'm going to look at the next generation of female change makers. I'm going to be looking at young female social entrepreneurs who are using their connectedness, their compassion, and their dedication to change the future. So let's go ahead and start by looking a little bit more at Pretty Purposeful. So my sister and I, in 2012, watched a documentary called A Walk to Beautiful that was about women suffering from this condition called obstetric fistula in Ethiopia in the efforts of Catherine Hamlin. And before watching this documentary, we had never heard of this issue before, and that's the name of the documentary. And we were so shocked because so many women suffered from this condition, and it was so horrible. Obstetric fistula is essentially caused by four factors, by malnutrition, child marriage, a lack of access to health care and cultural practices. So all of these factors combined lead to girls with very small bodies giving birth at a young age to full-size babies and often enduring an obstructed labor as a result of this. And so this causes the tissue to rub together and form a hole or fistula in the birth canal. And this causes them to lose all control of their bodily functions. And in 93% of, case, of cases, fistula patients also lose their child. Usually, they can no longer bear children. As a result of this, they're left by their husbands, rejected by their families because they have no purpose in their society anymore, and they're shunned by their communities. They can't go anywhere. They have a horrible stench. They can't ride on buses. They can't be part of their society at all. And so these women are left with no purpose and no hope for the future. And while obstetric fistula is such a debilitating and horrible condition, why don't we talk about it in the developing world? When there's currently, or in the, or in the developed world rather, when there's currently over two million cases in the developed world, an estimated 100,000 new cases develop every year, and only about 15,000 of those are treated annually. And I believe a big part of the reason of why we don't discuss this is because of stigma. Maternal health isn't an issue that's fun to discuss. And so when my sister and I started our nonprofit, we decided that we had two goals. The first was to raise funds for obstetric fistula repair surgeries, but also to raise awareness regarding the issue. So we started by putting on an event, it was our first effort, and we thought even if we can only raise $1,000, it would be really cool to just raise enough to know that we gave one woman a repair surgery and a second chance at life. So we started putting on events in our community. Our first event was called Camp Pretty Purposeful. We had about 80 girls attend and about 10 different speakers, and the focus was empowerment. So we had speakers talk about how to write a book, how to start a nonprofit, and how girls could be confident and be themselves and make an impact by doing that. And so our focus was twofold, to both inspire girls in our community to reach their full potential and also raise funds for obstetric fistula repair surgeries. So we were able to raise enough for five surgeries with this event, and it was small, but it was a start. And after that, we were determined to keep fundraising. And so through different fundraising methods, we've been able to raise enough for 70 surgeries so far, as well as contributing <laughs> as well as contributing to the refurbishment of a clinic in Sierra Leone that serves an estimated 300 or helps an estimated 300 women per year by giving them repair surgeries. So through these efforts, 
we have uh, been able to have a couple different ways of fundraising. So we have products that we sell on our website that were made, handmade by fistula patients. We have bags, jewelry, and these are made during pre-op and post-op by the patients. So you can support us by shopping our online store, prettypurposeful.org. And we also have uh, a lot of ways that the patients can be empowered while they're in uh, the clinic. And so this is a picture, one of my favorite pictures, uh, from one of our partner organizations, the Freedom from Fistula Foundation. And this is a ceremony after the patients have received their new dresses, they've had their surgeries, and they're ready to go back out into the world. And this picture is so powerful to me because you can see the transformation in their lives and the transformation in their faces. And our, this partner organization is partnered with a company called B-Box that creates solar-powered charging stations. So they've partnered up to give these women the charging stations. So after their surgery, it's really amazing to watch them go from being shoved to the corners of their society to actually being a central figure in their society, to becoming entrepreneurs, having these charging stations, having a sustainable business model, being able to support themselves, and being an important part of their community. So that's been really exciting for my sister and I to see the impact that just one surgery can have on transforming a woman's life. And so now that we've looked at maternal health and looked at the issue that I work to address of obstetric fistula, I want to step back and look big picture at some of the issues that girls and women face around the world. And these are what I like to call the three building blocks to empowering girls. So if girls are sick, if they suffer from a condition like obstetric fistula, or they're married off at a young age, or they don't have access to sanitary products that they need when they're on their period, and they miss school when they're on their period, if they're not healthy, they can't receive an education. But if girls are healthy, then they can be educated. And I believe that education really is the great gender equalizer. And then, when girls are educated, they can have access to opportunities. They can be involved in economies, in politics, in their culture, and reshaping their culture. So those are the three building blocks, and I want to look at these in a little bit more detail. So the first is health. The above list, the first half of the list, are problems that affect everyone, but affect women and girls in a really significant percentage. And then below, we have problems that especially affect only women and girls. FGM, maternal health, and access to medical care for maternal health. So FGM stands for female genital mutilation which is extremely common in the developing world and affects hundreds of millions of girls. FGM is an extremely outdated cultural practice that also, in its root, is very sexist, trying to take away a, a sort of power and pleasure from women and girls. And it's also extremely dangerous. It, with, the girls bleed to death every year from FGM and also from infections, from being cut with rusty knives. So these are problems that affect women and girls health-wise. In terms of maternal health, there's 800 maternal health uh, deaths caused by maternal health every day, which is one every two minutes, to put it in perspective. This is from last summer. I was able to travel to Kenya, and the reason of a trip was to visit fistula clinics. But I was also able to go to an FGM rescue center in Kenya, which was a really amazing experience. So the girls in this picture come from uh, the Maasai tribes in Kenya, and they're at risk of undergoing FGM. So the rescue center not only rescues them, but also gives them amazing opportunities in terms of giving them access to education. And they just had their first class of girls graduate, and one of the girls who's 18 is going to the UK to study aeronautical engineering. So it's really amazing to see the transformation in their lives of not only being rescued, but also being excited and having so much purpose. I remember talking to all the girls in this picture and I asked them, what do you want to be? And they said, I want to be an engineer. I want to be a pilot. And the girl in the front in the green dress said, I want to be a brain surgeon. So it's really exciting to see the transformative effects we can have when we invest in girls. And the second building block is education. Once girls are healthy, then they can focus on receiving an education. This is one of my favorite education activists, Malala Yousafzai. Malala was shot in the head by the Taliban for going to school in Pakistan, but she still continues to fight for girls' right to education around the world. There's currently 66 million of-age schoolgirls who aren't in school. Let's change that. Once girls are healthy and once girls are educated, then they can have opportunities. And this is a picture of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who was the first female president of Liberia and the first female president in Africa. When women are involved socially, politically, and economically in their countries, they are not only empowered personally, but they also create a cycle of change. And I know that's definitely been 
a big theme here today, talking about empowering other women. And women, there's statistics that women reinvest 90% of their income back in their families and back in their communities. So when we reinvest in women, they help to change the culture. They raise their children differently. They take out the damaging parts of their culture. They reinvest in other women, and they change the political atmosphere of their society. These are some statistics about women worldwide. Women account for two-thirds of the world's population that lives in poverty. And women perform two-thirds of the world's work, but earn only one-tenth of the income. And currently, 19% of the world's parliamentarians are women, which may sound like a small percentage, but it's actually huge progress if you consider the fact that there used to be no women in politics whatsoever. And so now that we've looked at maternal health and specifically overall the, the big picture of the problems that girls face in the developing world when it comes to health, education, and opportunity, I want to look at what's really exciting to me, what, the future of female change makers. I want to look at, uh, show you some other teen leaders who run their own nonprofits, who are young female social entrepreneurs, and they're using their creativity and compassion to create change. I think there's often a lot of pessimistic talk about millennials, about uh, my generation, uh, that we're self-centered or that we're addicted to technology, we don't know how to communicate anymore. But I like to be optimistic and look at the bright side of this. I think our generation is one of the most aware and compassionate generation. We really care about social issues. And we're also very connected, and I think we're able to use our, our connected with the technology and how seamless it is in our lives to create change in the ways that we want to. And last December, I was honored to be selected as a global team leader by the We Are Family Foundation. And I got to go to a summit in March and meet 29 other global team leaders from around the world. And it was really amazing to meet other teams who also ran their own nonprofits and had their own efforts to create change in their communities. And I want to show you three of the girls who I met at the summit. This is Aliri, and she started a nonprofit called Code Red. So Code Red's purpose is twofold, similar to Pretty Purposeful's, to give women menstrual hygiene products when they're on their period, especially homeless women and women who can't afford them, and also to spread awareness about periods. And periods aren't something that we like to talk about. Again, there's a lot of stigma. When we're on our period, we're like, hey, can you pass me a tampon? It's like this huge secret. And none of us, no one's supposed to know that we have periods. But yet, when it's something that causes millions of girls in the developing world to miss school every month, get behind and often drop out, I think it's something that's worth discussing. And that's what Elyria is addressing through her nonprofit. This is Renita, who started a nonprofit called Pedal to Prosperity in the seventh grade after a trip to India. And she gives girls bicycles so that they can go to school. In the developing world, millions of girls often walk six miles just to go to school, and this causes them to drop out. When they drop out at a young age, they're more susceptible to child marriage and prostitution. And keeping girls in school, as we showed earlier, is an incredible investment in communities and in the future of the world. So Renita, by providing them with bicycles, has currently given 234 girls in India and Africa bicycles, and every single one of them is still in school today. Yeah. And finally, I want to show you Saika. Saika started a nonprofit called Microloans for Moms that gives microloans to women in Nepal and empowers them to be entrepreneurs, to be financially independent, and provide for their families. And as I mentioned earlier, when women have a source of income, they reinvest that in their families and in their communities. And I really think that investing in the next generation of girls is one of the best ways that we can collectively change the world. I also want to end by thanking all of you here today for being who you are. By being female entrepreneurs and female business women, you've set an example and you've paved the way for girls like me, girls like Aliri and Saika and Bernita to be the next generation of female change makers. And I think just the amazing excitement and energy in this room and the dedication to creating change is what's going to help us all empower a billion women. Thank you.